We've now established at the global level a common, a common framework, a common platform for action. Companies have always said um, we need greater convergence of standards. We're subject to pressures from so many different sides. Everybody has their own code. Everybody has different expectations. Uh, that era is coming to a close. Uh, we have a consolidated um, uh, set of expectations uh, uh, of governments as well as businesses. Oh, there's a danger that we lose momentum. There's a danger that people think, well, job done. Uh, and it's quite the opposite. Um, we really need a step change now to use the opportunity of the framework to change performance. The guiding principles really focus the subject back onto the individuals, the individuals uh, impacted uh, by business and making them part of the processes that are needed. So this issue of engaging with your affected stakeholders uh, is an area that on the one hand isn't new to the discussion of business and human rights, but on the other hand I think now is offered a uh, room for a real step change in how it's approached. Make real the proposition that at a minimum companies must use the guiding principles, if not literally verbatim in every possible industry context, at least to review and adapt and then enact the guiding principles where they make most sense for their industry and their, for their company. Offshoring the decentralization of jobs is continuing. And a lot of those jobs that were sent out were frankly not supported by decent working conditions and by human and labor rights. If we could provide jobs with rights, I think you do create a counterbalance, a counterweight, some kind of platform underneath those people. And you create some belief in the system, some stake in the system that is a counter to extremist ideologies and to marginalization, and which gives human rights something of their moral authority back because they actually mean something to people. I think one of the most important things is to try and make the connection between human rights and corruption, and then begin to identify the responsibilities that business have. And we think any corruption affects the responsibility of the state to fulfill rights. So if resources are being taken away because of corruption, then it means it's undermining the state responsibility to fulfill human rights. Well, at a time when jobs are scarce, and at the same time when the population is growing in many parts of the world where people don't have jobs and other parts of the world where there are opportunities, I think the big challenge is migration, migrant workers. Um, that's part of the business and human rights agenda because here you see rights play out in a very concrete and sometimes tragic way through the exploitation of those who cross borders. Recently there were riots in London, the city where I live, and uh, at that time there was a lot of panic and people immediately wanted to know what Facebook was doing, what YouTube was doing, what Twitter was doing and what Blackberry was doing. Now of course in some instances people who were committing the riots were able to communicate each other using the technology that was provided to them. But it was also the way and the means through which parents could tell their children not to go to certain parts of town because had they gone there, that would have been a problem. So the impulse of the state to regulate and protect meant that the government wanted to impose certain controls. But the controls are always a double-edged sword. And the worry that I have, and many of us have, is that in this kind of a context, what we are going to find is that states are going to lean on, on companies, and the companies will then be in a double bind, that do we say yes to Britain, but no to Egypt? Or do we always say no to everybody? Or do we always say yes to everybody? And clearly the answer is somewhere in between. And to do that, they need a proper framework, proper thinking. I personally think we have to make a big effort uh, to deal more with the shareholders. Of course, we have shareholders who are ethically uh, motivated, but it's still a tiny minority. And I think we have to start dealing with the big shareholders, the pension funds in Europe, in the United States. Curiously enough, I think in the Chinese case, the fact that China is going global is, is a tremendous opportunity um, for organizations like the Institute. Uh, the Chinese have always taken the position that, um, that they don't tolerate interference in 
domestic affairs, certainly their own domestic affairs. They have been, at least in public, unresponsive to criticism of human rights at home. However, they are concerned with being able to operate as an international actor. So just as China joining the WTO had a, a big impact on how Chinese uh, commercial and legal practice operated at home because it had to. Um, so China going abroad is, the lessons are beginning to feed back into Beijing. Climate change is having such an undermining impact on the poorest, but also the opportunity side is access um, to, uh, access for all to energy, um, and it's uh, renewable energy. There is now an interest in uh, those who are involved in solar and other to reach the poor consumer. But for me, there's a whole range of people that are below that. Um, the kind of uh, 1.4 billion who have no access to electricity in their home. The 2.7 billion who still cook on firewood and ingest fumes. And uh, I think there's a, an interesting issue of uh, not just respecting human rights, but uh, being part of addressing a huge unfairness. Access to water and sanitation will be a major issue of focus for 2012. Based on statistics, over 1 billion people don't have access to water and over 2.4 billion people still don't have access to adequate sanitation. With the internationally recognised human right to water, the responsibilities for business have become much more clear, especially for water users and water service providers. There is a situation of free riders where smaller players can get away without good performances and nothing happens. And, and we need to work a lot on, on differentiating good performance from bad performance. And, 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 and stakeholders need to know who is who. But I also see in, in, their, in export agencies and these type of institutions that they want to reward the good performers, and that would be a play a, a great role in the dissemination because there will be an incentive to embrace this new guiding principle. Mm -hmm.